welcome everyone to the curatorial roundtable for um, this second semester of the year. The roundtable is the weekly event that we do at the uh, MA Curatorial Practice Program at the School of Visual Arts in New York, where I invite um, interesting, distinguished curators, institutional directors from around the world to speak about their practice, um, talk about specific uh, exhibitions that they've done, and um, I would say to speak to the international nature of it, um, it's thrilling and it's been a challenge and we've finally done it, Mescarum, um, to, to have you here from Ethiopia. Um, I'm just going to read a short bio that you had sent uh, so that the audience has a sense of um, who you are. Um, so Meskram is a curator, anthropologist, writer, and co-founder of Zoma Museum with Elias Sime in um, Ethiopia. Um, and she cura curated, and I hope I'll pronounce this correctly, Gizyawi. Is that correct? Gizyawi, yeah. Uh -huh. Number one, an art happening, Divine Light by David Hammonds in Addis Ababa and Green Flame, the visual art exhibition of the New Crowned Hope Festival by Peter Sellers in Vienna. She co-curated Eye of the Needle Eye of the Heart at the Santa Monica Museum of Art with Peter Sellers, um, curvature of events at the Stadtliche Kunstsammlungen Dresden, Johannes Heile with different eyes, um, vital signs at the Katzen Art Center in Washington, D.C. She recently co-designed and constructed the landscape and buildings at the Menelik's Grand Palace and is currently constructing Zoma Village and Toto. I wonder if you're still doing that. We'll talk about it. And restoring the Sof Umar Cave in Bale of southeastern Ethiopia with Sime in Addis Ababa. Uh, Meskaram has participated in various workshops and symposia, including those organized at MoMA, Tate Modern, Simam in Spain, and Yale Directors Forum. She was awarded France's Chevalier dans l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres and has been a member of the selection committees for Dac Art and the Venice Biennale African Pavilion. So with that, Meskaram, I guess I will just turn it over to you. We'll um, talk for 45 minutes or so for your presentation. Um, and then at the end to the audience, it's your opportunity <clears throat> to um, type into the chat or rather the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, any questions that you have for Meskaram. So let's begin and um, I will once again share the screen. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Um, I um, have been working like crazy for the last um, four years uh, on huge amount of projects and uh, they're all hands on. I actually came for this meeting from uh, another huge construction. Um, so it's it's been a wild, wild, wild year. However, um, this is an incredible opportunity to be here and talk about what I do, and it's such an honor to be here too. So what I do is, um, I have been, um, I started creating when I was um, when I was young, uh, and um, and then I, um, I'm actually, um, my curatorial practice was hands on, and I started. I didn't even know what I was doing was curating when I started. And I um, used to live in California and and then lived in Ohio. Um, and I am a graduate from Antioch University. So I um, the curatorial work I did was mostly um, something I, you know, I, I used to put together photographic shows or um, uh, like mixed shows, uh, which had music, dance, and, and also visual art. And, and, and also had a lot of interest in, um, in landscaping and things like that too, which uh, I did outdoor shows, including uh, some, um, uh, some shows with Shakespeare. And so that kept on growing. And then, um, then suddenly, um, after many years, in uh, I think 2002, I was invited by the Museum of Modern Art 
to uh, go there because I because I returned to Ethiopia and was working in Ethiopia, still doing curatorial work and showing a number of exhibitions, including bringing um, even Indian, uh, no, uh, Native American art um, uh, or Native American masks to Ethiopia. Um, and um, uh, the Yemeni exhibition or um, Indian exhibition, just to bring the world into Ethiopia, I, I, we opened art space. And then from there on, it just um, continued. And then MoMA found out that I was doing these activities and invited me. Um, Gizia number one was the a show I did immediately after MoMA. But the MoMA invitation was very, very instrumental to my career because I suddenly met a um, large number of uh, people in the art community who were doing very interesting things in major museums. I got connected to some of the biggest museums in the US. And, um, and then um, I, um, from the, um, um, from um, um, from MoMA, uh, one of the things that I found out was there was they just started they just opened um, the um, school the uh, what's it the Bart School of Curatorial Curatorial School, and I was um, invited with the group to see what they were doing, and I um, actually uh, thought it was I I couldn't understand how they could teach curating. Because for me, it was an artistic process where I take an artwork from an artist or from a number of artists and then recreate it like an installation art. So that my curatorial practice, like any story, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So, so that's how I've always treated curating. I, uh, I want the audience to walk in feeling like there is something that captures them. And then they get in the middle of the, of the story as they walk around. And then when they end the exhibition, I want them to walk out wanting to come back. So that that was an artistic process. And then my um, uh, that I um, I've um, so I explained that to uh, to to the to the professors there. Uh, you know, I wanted to understand how you could teach curating because I. I you know, uh, it's it's a form. Of, I thought it was a form of art, and to this day, I follow that. I follow that artistic process. When I when an artist gives me give me their work, I actually take it. Um, I, I take it, and I don't want to discuss with them how I'm going to do the curatorial work. Then I then it becomes my art. So that. You know, and, and that's my relationship. That's always been my relationship with different artists. So um, when I did Giziari number one, which was a temporary show, it means temporary, the word itself. And I invited a number of artists, including David Hammonds, to come to Ethiopia, which he did a year later, but he was very fascinated on what we did at Giziari. And that's why he, he wanted to come uh, and, and, do, and do an exhibition here. Um, so um, the show was, we actually did a live exhibition with major music, you know, like Mulato Astatke, you know, he's a major jazz musician or the Ethiopian jazz, the founder. Um, and so we had, we merged dance music and visual arts, but the visual arts were the strongest because they, it was being made live as the public was watching. And uh, it took a three, it, it, the whole process was three days. But we had also a lot of uh, in-kind and monetary funding for it, for it. And in the end, we burned all the work. So that kind of struck a chord a little bit. And um, so as you can imagine, um, you know, that all these major activities in a country that was just coming out of a revolution uh, was um, was uh, it just added something to the city, and then um, Peter Sellers found out about what I was doing, um, and that's because of MoMA. And uh, MoMA didn't tell him, but the the travels we did with MoMA, another uh, museum director told him about it in California, and then he invited me to do a show in um, in in Vienna when he did Mozart's 250th birthday. Um, he asked me, can you 
can you be the head curator for that, the head visual curator? And I told him, really, me? What have I got to do with, with Mozart? It was uh, my first question. But then I ended up reading a lot about Mozart and um, and also hearing Peter talk about him and what he has done and all the, his contribution to the music world and also his political stand. I thought it was quite fascinating. And I so I did another a major show in Vienna for for his 250th birthday. It was called the New Crown Hope Festival. And my specific show was called Green Flame. And I named it Green Flame. This just, just, just gives you an idea of my curatorial practice. I named it Green Flame because at the time, France was burning. A lot of young people were uh, were turning over cars. You know, there, were, there was a huge revolt and they were all young. And it was, that was, the news was about the French um, activity. And I thought, oh my God, these are young people, which is green. And this is great with the green flame is going on. And what's, so it was just timely. So that's why I feel what I do in, 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 in curatorial work is also a, a practice of that, um, of, of paying attention to what's happening around you at the same time. Then I moved on and um, um, and then my, um, you know, did a lot of different shows and I met Elias and um, Elias Sime, um, who I found was so amazing because his brain is big and he's he's unafraid to, to try anything. So we traveled around uh, different parts of the world and the country and started um, working on uh, on major exhibitions, I started curating his exhibition, and and that also caught the world's attention. And then, um, uh, and then moving moving forward, um, I uh, after doing a lot of exhibitions in Ethiopia as well, I was invited uh, by uh, the German um, Ministry of Culture and the Cultural Institute um, for a meeting in Angola. And um, so I, I proposed to them, why don't I do an exhibition uh, or, you know, as I told, so they were talking, you know, we always come to this meetings, to the curatorial talks, but what's the outcome? What, what, what do we do after, you know, it's just, yeah, it's good, it looks good on my resume, but what else? And then uh, the director at the time said, so what do you, do you have uh, something to offer? And I said, yeah, um, uh, why don't I curate an exhibition in Europe um, about European art from my perspective. And she said, she took it and she went around uh, all over and, um, uh, you know, then she talked to a number of museums, but then I, she asked me in the end, you know, would you be interested in doing a show in Dresden? I thought that was what I, I, I felt very strong that, um, uh, you know, the history of Dresden was, was so fascinating. <clears throat> so I decided, yeah, I definitely will take it, even though she said, you know, it's East, it used to be East German. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then she also told me that, you know, there's very little people like you. And I said, oh, that makes it even more interesting. So I definitely want to do this show. So I went to Dresden and it took me about two years going through their archive and um, and uh, looking at all the collections of the all the European collections. I wanted to know the artists very well. So I decided in the end after about a year of just researching and understanding the whole process, I decided, you know, I think I, what I should do is make a video exhibition with a German artist I met and this Italian artist and an Ethiopian artist. Uh, I selected about 60 pieces of work from Arbertinum and also the Zwinger, which is the uh, the oldest museum, and Dresden had the largest European art collection, and took this sixty pieces dealing work. I, you know what I wanted to do is I wanted to start about four hundred years ago and then um, stop at uh, I believe nineteen fourteen or something like that. I didn't want to deal with the Second World War and I didn't want to deal with um, with all the uh, the communist era. I just wanted to feel to get the artists and how they responded to the society and how they were dealing with issues that are related to us today about gender issue, um, the um, environment, um, you know, uh, just everything else that we are concerned about. 
And so I selected work from that. And then each artist, each video artist did um, eight movies under three minutes. That was a curatorial decision. I was not going to take anything that was over three minutes because I didn't want to create an audience fatigue. I wanted uh, the, ex the exhibition viewer to walk into the gallery and walk out within an hour rather than having to stop every place and not see the whole thing or or that. But anyway, so in the end, um, that exhibition became very successful. They had one of the largest audiences. We have a catalog, it's online. Um, every channel of events. And what made that interesting is also it kind of, this was in, I think it was 19, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, 2000, um, I believe it was 2014. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, it's in front of me. You know, I lose track of time because I've done a lot of work. In 2014, yeah, uh, 2015. So it, it, uh, it went on for a while. And, um, but the, the, the thing about this exhibition is, you know, the media kept asking me, how do you do European art? And I said, but I'm doing art. You know, uh, there's art, there's the visual art is a visual language. And what makes you, the visual language interesting is that it's something that we look with our eyes. We don't have to be literate, we don't have to read to understand what is visual. Anybody can see visual. And also issues can be described in any way. And so if I'm not told about the artist, I, you know, what I see tells me what the artist did and um, and what the artist was talking about. So, you know, the Rembrandt show of a child being lifted from uh, from from the ground and um, and and the person screaming down there the, on, on the on the on the ground looking up that there's a whole conversation there's a whole dialogue that was created by this artist that's so relevant to today and so uh, and the religious arts the political arts the um, you know the the racial relationships at the time um just anything so uh that's why i felt strongly that um, one of my uh, favorite shows to me is curvature of events i'm not sure if i'm going over my time I'm not keeping track, but um, I no, can stop fine. here and, and answer no, questions. No, 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 you're you're fine. It's only nine twenty. You have plenty of okay. time. Okay, okay. Um, so then, um, then I, you know, um, I, uh, you know, what I enjoy about curating is the fun of it. Um, you know, to make it, I don't like to have the audience feel uh, betrayed or even feel fatigued. I want the audience to come in and feel that they have, there's a conversation in, in it, there is a, there's an engagement. So there is, you know, so what, what, when I do cure, when I curate any show, I make sure that there's interaction and, and, um, and uh, much, uh, much more lively exhibitions. So I can, give you many examples of the, the number of exhibitions we did. Then what happened is um, I, um, we, you know, this whole time I always felt like museums needed to be looked at from different perspective. What else are there? What's human about them? How do we make them? Do they all have to be, to look alike? Um, do, uh, can, can we art think from a completely different perspective? So, uh, so was building a museum somewhere in the world. It didn't have to be in Ethiopia. I, I honestly see myself as a human being, and I mean that. And so I, where it was happening was not even necessary to me. It just it was just co a coincidence that that I found Elias, and then who actually bought into this dream that I had for many years. And then we, um, after a lot of effort, ended up buying a piece of land and then expanded the land. Uh, we kept on buying the, the land next door because I realized that if we don't buy the land, the museum is not going to survive. So sustainability was a major thing. And if, Cause if you rent it, somebody's going to take it away and you, and you just have the idea that just popped one day. But sustainability, and if we build a museum, it had to be continuous. So it's not going to be inherited by my children or something like that. So there was going to be a, a committee 
um, that will run it after I die. So I always think about what happens after I die, uh, you know, uh, who takes over. So, and so this museum, <coughs> sorry, this museum, museum became kind of an iconic museum. And uh, although we didn't think of it that way, I thought it was just, just needed to happen. And so the city um, really, and the media kept on uh, advertising it. And also what's inside the museum, like the school, the galleries, the animals and the, the garden and all that just um, became, it's, it's all over the, the media. You, so, I mean, uh, you can Google Zoma Museum and you find thousands of information. Yeah. And so it attracted the world. And so the people started coming there. As soon as they arrived to Ethiopia, the first place they want to go is Zoma Museum. And then now we're on the Ethiopian Airlines um, video. Like when you get on the flight, you actually see a little, a little clip of, of Zoma. And so suddenly, you know, uh, as we were working on this, um, the prime minister, the new prime minister of Ethiopia showed up at, at, at the gate. <laughs> And which kind of shocked all of us because I, I don't even have, I haven't had a TV for over thirty years, thirty five years. So I don't know. I, I, I threw away my TV much more when I was very young, and so I did not. I only saw his photographs on taxis and video on 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 the streets because he was new in the country. Was excited to have this young young leader, and so he came and he visited and he said. He was impressed. He stayed for over an hour. And even on that same day, he came back again uh, with his family. And so, I mean, having a prime minister in your place, in your, in your museum was like, wow, what is, what is this? But the interesting thing is that he took us and he wanted us to transform the, um, the, the old palace, the, the, the compound into an artistic uh, garden. Which, by the way, is could be <laughs> could be wonderful, but it's also not something I was looking to do because I'm not a I don't want to have my career as a gardener. But what we did was I said, "Come on, Elias, we need to work on this," and um, we turned it into a we t we transformed the ground into a we looked at the ground like a canvas and transformed it into an artistic venture. So the whole garden is a work of art. And um, and then that impressed him. So he kept on like, can you do this? Can you do that? And then uh, he one day he said on the Toto Mountain, okay, for all the work you've done, uh, what I want to do is I want to give you guys this land to to work on it, but it's going to be your money. So Toto the the Toto Zoma happened as a result. So we're then it became construction. We start building. The buildings are I I want to show you photos, but you can also find that and I will send it. Um, the buildings are actually, they go around trees because I one no. thing I wanted to make sure was that we didn't cut the indigenous trees. So the shapes are very irregular and they're all floating on the air uh, on a column because um, I want the landscape to continue to exist without having so much disturbance. And that, um, Oh, this is the, what you're seeing is the Zoma, um, uh, the, the Zoma Museum. But uh, the, the, yeah, uh, you can see the the the, the Earth buildings there. Um, so in any case, um, this this continued, um, and so to this day, where I'm right now in the, in the midst of doing a lot of construction, um, and I honestly want to go back to curating and um and uh, luckily i have a major curatorial work that i'm doing in venice um uh, uh, right at the entrance of venice this is going to be elias's show it's a solo show but it's going to be really uh, really beautiful um so my heart and my passion is uh really working uh, in a curatorial work and uh, and do and do art so my life is too much. I, I unless I stop somewhere, but I can answer any question <laughs> you want now. Um, all right, let me um stop sharing the screen that way I can see <laughs> people's hands. Sorry. Um so if you have a question, 
<clears throat> um, please put it in the Q and A. Um, but in the meantime, let me start messing around by um, just going back to the the show that you did at the Albertinum. You know, um, the question of decolonization is one that's something that's on everybody's mind for quite a while now. Um, so it's interesting for an Ethiopian curator to be introduced to that collection, uh, intervene in that collection, et cetera. Um, you said that you, you wanted to approach it. And in fact, that was sort of your, your sales pitch when you met with the, with the Germans was look at European art from your perspective. So I'm just curious about that in terms of a, a kind of decolonial gesture. Did you think of it in those terms or, you know, how did you think about um, your approach as an Ethiopian working with um, a colonialist collection? Well, you know, I, I don't look at it as a colonialist co collection because it kind of narrows it down for me. I, okay. I, I, I really don't want to narrow the, um, the artist, <coughs> I'm sorry, the artists uh, who were at a different era and the collections, when I, I was overwhelmed when I went to the collections because the, the amount was huge and I was really deeply looking into them. And that's why it took me some time going through their books and understanding, I wanted to understand the art pieces that really touched my soul. And I wanted to get to know the artists and also not only the artists, but the time that the art was made and the political situation of the country when, when the art was made. And also, um, you know, how people reacted to it too. So I, I wanted every work to, to, um, to be human. Because, mm -hmm. you know, what these artists did was they were expressing their emotions. They were expressing their feelings, you know, What's fascinating, even in Dresden and other places too, as you, um, as I walk around the compound, you have this, um, this, this uh, sculptures outside all over the buildings, and you can see when you look at them close up closely, you can see how they were making mockery of their government at the time. You know how they were, really they, you know they look like just any sculpture, but when you take a closer look, they're like, even to a point sometimes they're sticking their tongue out and like, um, and then you, you try to understand these characters, even if they are the, maybe the ancient Greek um, goddesses or whatever they are, or gods, um, and, and you try to relate why the artist picked that work under what condition and who was this, uh, this character that they selected and what was the situation at the time so there was there was a lot of reading I had to do to understand all this. Um, so the colonial part is um, if I this is why I want to skip that era. If I um, if I will were, were to focus, I would be I would lose my focus as well if I were to go in the colonial art um, dialogue. Mm -hmm. but however. Uh, it's it's always an issue that needs to be dealt with. You know, my the way I looked at this art pieces from my perspective um, should not be a rare situation. I think we should curate each other's work, and um, and then see how we see how we get to know each other better, because I think um, culture has that capacity to do that. But. Um, you know, um, yeah, the issue of uh, returning art from Europe and all this, and I was asked so many questions by journalists about this at the time, especially when the French um, PM had um, had made an issue of it. Um, you know, one of the questions I was asked was, you know, "What do you, what do you think, and uh, about this return?" And my my question is, well, if the country decides to return this artwork, they should not put conditions on what should happen to them. And if they are worried about what should happen to them, then they should return them with all the um, the protection, the money, the museums and everything else. So there is, with the cameras and everything else, so they will continue to live in a museum life. Mm -hmm. 
Because mm -hmm. returning them to a place where that's not ready to accept to take them, I don't see the point. I think it's um it, it so I I that that's my view. Mm -hmm. So that's why I thought um you know having someone like me curate a show in Europe kind of brings out a different perspective, simply because it's almost like a taboo. Because that's the questions that I was being asked by journalists was how how do you see where where do you find Africa? I said I didn't come here to have, find Africa. Mm. I came here to find art, and I came here to meet the artists. And so, I I think you get what I'm saying. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm curious though. You know, you've obviously, as you said in a very casual way, you know, people have um, um, been attracted to what you do. And you've been invited and invited again and invited again. Can you characterize for a moment um, your approach a little bit more? You know, you I understand what you said, and I've taken some notes about you say, you know, you think curating should be fun. You want to engage an audience. You want your exhibitions to be interactive. But um, what is it about your shows, the way that you go about curating, the way that you place objects in space, um, that would you say is characteristically you that attracts people to keep inviting you? And obviously um, on a very serious high level. Yeah. I think um, I, I like to be myself. And I also like to talk about issues that worry me because then when it's honest you can actually do a better job at it because I don't have to recreate a story so I like to tell a story that I know and that that actually affects me uh, for instance you know I, I you know the environment affects me or the um, um, and also the way we treat each other affects me mm -hmm um and how we can survive and how we can even call ourselves environmentalists when we think about um you know when we think about censorship for instance or not um, censor, i'm sorry um when we think about um um copyrights for instance you cannot be an environmentalist and be and worry about copyrights you have to share that is this information and you can't be greedy about what you share about mm. knowledge Mm. And so then when I, when I find art or artists who deal with this, I grab it and then I, I, then I tell the story as I feel it. And when I do that, um, then the story comes out right. And then you, you, the audience feels it. I feel it. The audience feels it. Um, so, uh, you, you know, what is the point of, well, how could we claim ourselves to be environmentalists when we continuously try to uh, have a society that has the have the um, um, how do you call it the um, um, a society that wants to grandiose itself or a competitive society uh, that wants to have the best of the best all the time and then leave out thousands you know in the way they are so you know, when you think about these things, then then the artwork starts making sense. Then you start looking at, you start creating a story, but the story has to be somewhat whimsical. The story has to be unpainful because painful stories just add pain to the pain. So mm. how do you make it fun so the audience can grab this the, this very huge story and at the same time <laughs> uh, feel comfortable enough to be engaged and to change. So that is the trick of the the curatorial work. I think that's um, uh, being. I I, th I don't like take curating lightly. I take it as a very very big responsibility, and that's why I uh, I try to perfect it as much as I could. Hmm. Um, so we have a question from Carolina Rito. Good morning. Thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask you a question about the audience. You say that you think a lot about the audience experience and how you want people to feel. How do you take stock of the audience experience? What are the parameters you use to understand what the show is doing to the audience? I think you've touched on that a bit, but that's a follow-up to what you've just been saying. Yeah. 
I, I just want to give you an example. Um, when we did, um, when I did um, um, Eye of the Needle, Eye of the Heart in California at Santa mm -hmm. Monica Museum, the audience came in, which was fascinating, in tears. We had many people coming in tears, but it was not tears of sad, well, somewhat sadness, but um, it was not, and so that shocked the artist too. Elias was totally shocked when having all these many people, you know, looking at him like, what has he done? I think those tears were, you know, there was something in the in the exhibition that was touching something that was missing in their lives. Although it that wasn't the intention of the exhibition, it but it it it, it became that. Hmm. And so I recently heard someone who went to see uh, one of Elias's work in um, in Miami, and the woman said, "I walked in, and all I could, uh, all I did was cry." It could be the intensity of the work, could be the um, the material, or it could be the the composition. But I know for sure in in in, um, in Santa Monica, they walked in, and everybody was in shock. So that's the even though. You know, that reaction was a bit much to, for us, but at the same time, what we did there was put so much into making sure that the stories were told right. We had a whole bunch of goats, so you can, you can Google that, the Santa Monica Museum of Art, um, Eye of the Needle, Eye of the Heart. And the floor was covered with this goats, who were hugging, um, like in all positions, in all kinds of human um, body touch position, about body feeling positions, mm -hmm. and um, and then the wall pieces <clears throat> at the same time, and the earth pieces and everything else, wow. you know, something that is, you know, the something that's happening because I lived in the West as well, and so something missing that uh, that human touch, that human real touch where where you don't feel ashamed for touching someone and i think um art should do that art should actually cause you to question who you are and what is happening and then it should lead you to it should you know it should lead you to to, to be better hmm. so um you know i'm curious about just to cover that for a moment, and then I'd like to ask about <clears throat> Zoma. Um, what was shocking? Uh, you know, I'm just curious if you could go into that a bit further. I've seen his work, of course, which is quite beautiful. Um, he shows uh, with James Cohan in New York. I saw the beautiful show there, the last one. Um, but what was shocking about it? I think, you know, um, uh, I, you know, I used this harmonica example, but the shocking thing is when you look at the braidings, for instance, if I if I talk um, about the um, the wall pieces that are um, the, made with electric wires, mm -hmm. the, 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 the amount of weaving that took place, the amount of human um, in, uh, in, in trick, the intricacy of the work, and the time that's spent on it, and the the volume of the work, the 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 largeness, and also the composition. If you don't, I mean, the the closer you get to the work, the more you get shocked, because who would do that? Hmm. And in in that mass amount, and then who would, you know, who would tell a story, of um. Of, of human stories. These are just people's stories, regardless of where you come from, because we're all using computers. And our, but the, the, using the computer, the computer that we use in our hands, the computer that we, you and I are using right now, it came from the earth too, because the parts have been ex extracted mm -hmm. from, from that, which actually affects the environment. Right. And if you don't, so this, 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 the, the work shows you the amount, you know, patience 
and um, also um, perfectionism. At the same time, you also see the waste. Right. Of um, do we really need it? <laughs> and so as, as an artist and also as a curator, you really have to show it enough. You should have to give it enough power that will, if, if, if the composition doesn't shock you, the the uh the material and the amount of work put into it should shock you hmm. if you're not shocked by any of them then i don't know <laughs> and then yeah then what then what happens to you so let's segue um back to zoma for a moment you know you said that it's become an iconic institution could you talk a little bit to us about um the architecture and also the programming that's being done there that would make it a new iconic institution? Well, the, the construction, you know, it was a toxic land, literally a toxic land that we transformed into a museum. And uh, and, and literally that's what we were trying to get even from the get-go. Um, we wanted the government to give us land when they never did so, that's why we bought it. It was cheap because it was, nobody wanted it. Now the whole neighborhood became expensive, which is a little bit annoying, but the, um, the whole neighborhood has, because there's Zoma and everybody wants to buy near us. Mm -hmm. Can't afford it anymore. But the, the building itself is how far can you take Earth's building or buildings, instead of using cement that's so destructive, how do you use lime and work with lime that have lasted for thousands of years? Look at the Colosseum in, in, in Rome or uh, and, or you go to Egypt, go to anywhere, wherever they built these ancient buildings that are still standing for thousands of years, something is right about the construction. And what happened to the construction business and, and why, why, you know, what's the speed? So when you come to Zoma, you automatically calm down because the, the artwork on the wall, the landscape, the, the, the zigzag walks and all the plants, the various plants and the animals calm you down. It brings you down to, to reality because every, every, every food you eat comes from, from, from the earth, you know, everything, every product we use on our face comes from the animals or anything else, but, we're, but we're far distance from them. And then also we have a school in there, which is very different from any of the schools we have in the country. We only take 15 students in a classroom and we have hundreds of people on a waiting list because we can't take more than 15. Uh, we have about 160 students. But the, the school itself is uh, about teaching kids how to love to learn. So like the Montessori schools or the Waldorf schools, we don't give homeworks. We um, we teach kids to read to each other, to learn reading. We have co-readings. And the kids plant, they really literally plant and they produce and they sell the products. And then you have that, the edible school yards in the US. Um, and then you then you do, um, the, the uh, actually the way we teach them, there's the Ethiopian ancient system of teaching where the older child is the teacher to the younger child. And that's that's also um, uh, a technique we use there, but it's also in, in Europe and in the West, uh, the, the, even in Japan, mix, mixed age classrooms, we apply that. And they, the kids milk, because we have cows, we have dogs, we have um, goats, sheep, turtles. Uh, we, we rescued actually, the res rescued turtles, so the kids know their stories. And then we have rabbits and everything else. So, the, you know, it's not, it's it's a very uh, clean school with um, all the rules and regulations properly done. But you can see the product of this kids. We have autistic kids in the heart of the children who are, um, who are swallowed by the kids. So we don't, we call them by their names. We don't call them, this is so-and-so is autistic because you don't call so-and-so has a heart problem, so-and-so has a, kidney issue or whatever with the kids so we we the first thing we do is we call them by their first names mm -hmm. and then they become part of the, the the team and then we also apply art and we teach them through art and through um, outdoors and everything else so that's 
is what makes it unique because it's a museum that has a school that has all these things. And um and it's you know it kind of grew organically, but it's um it's become very effective. So that's why people come in large number to see it. And the programming itself, how does that yeah, happen? The, yeah, yeah. We 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 bring um the, you know a, a, people book programming. They come from all over the world. We have exhibitions that go on, um, outdoor exhibition, indoor exhibitions. Sometimes um we had a photo exhibition from Italy one time, and we have um workshops, arts related workshops. Um, we do um. The programming we have a number of programming so I mean, it's ongoing and then we also have people who come into workshops and i love the workshops because they're more engaging and also community tree growing things i know like i'm i, I just right before i talked to you I, I just saw an email from the united nations who want to do some uh, some work with some artistic work with us and I have to read the whole thing but um, then I just glanced through it so there's we're constantly busy mm. with local activities as well as international um, international activities and the exhibitions themselves are how frequent are they <clears throat> I'm, sorry? I'm sorry how frequent it. are the how many shows do you do a year and are you the one oh. doing the curating are there guest <laughs> curators <laughs> Uh, what well, what's the infrastructure of the yeah. day? You know, it, it, like, it's kind of interesting. I know COVID has gone, has been since 2020, 2021, that's COVID year. Um, um, you know, the programs has not been very regular like we used to have, uh, but we do have at least mm, now four or five exhibitions a year. And um, we just finished one, and uh, Elias said uh, show because he hasn't shown his work in the country, so we're gonna have a small exhibition of his work there uh, soon. And um, yeah, we we do have, uh, and then we have you know our farmers market, which where which attracts a lot of artists to come, because that's our monthly activity. Um, but exhibitions and workshops um, and also theaters and um, performances of all kinds, mm -hmm. all, all these things happen. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of people working there. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask again, if there are any other questions, thank you, Carolina, for your question. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, what we would do, Meskaram, is we will switch to the other link that you got and that session just for a little while with the students um so i'm not seeing any other questions so i'm going to thank the audience um again we have the round table every week next week ruth estevez who's a distinguished curator right now is an independent curator in new york but has uh worked all around the world um uh, will speak with us and Meskram, thank you for this public session and we'll see you in a moment in the private one with the students. Thank you and thank you and I, my apologies for everything else, but thank you very no much. All right, see you in a moment. Bye to all.